chapter 7. The question I have before me is from verse 39. 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 39. I've got three questions. Uh, actually, I've got five. Uh, at least three that I'd like to get to uh, this evening. I make mention of Dwayne uh, came for our elders and deacons meeting at uh, at four thirty, uh, but Ginger wasn't feeling particularly well, and Devin was was there staying with her, and so he went ahead and went back to to sit with her this evening. I'm sure they'll probably uh, get tuned in here on the uh, on the Facebook stream, but uh, want to keep them in our prayers. I don't know if any of y'all could, could I could see Ginger when we started singing Happy Birthday. She just was beaming. I mean, it was a, and it was a total shock to her too. And uh, but um, it was, a, I got, I, I could witness it through the through the through the glass. It, it was greatness, and I appreciate everybody's effort uh, in that respect. Before we get started, let's go to our heavenly Father in prayer. Our great Sunday Father, we're so thankful for this day. We're thankful for the privilege we've had to, to be assembled and to worship. We uh, pray your blessings on us as we study uh, these matters that pertain to thy word this evening. Father, give us wisdom and understanding that, that we might uh, arrive at uh, proper uh, conclusions with respect uh, to your word. And that we might uh, understand what you want us to know and then to, to live and to teach those things uh, as, uh, as you would have us to do. Father, we continue to pray for Ginger. We're thankful. Uh, for the measure of health that has been granted to her in recent days. Uh, we pray for her with her upcoming treatment this week. We ask your richest blessings on, on her and on Dwayne. We're thankful for them and the great example they set. And we ask uh, that you also be with uh, Miss Jean and her family as they tend to her uh, from day to day. And others, we pray for, uh, pray for uh, 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 Bobby, that, uh, that he'll continue to, to gain strength and and uh, be able to uh, return and, and be back with us. Are the others that we uh, mentioned fr from time to time, we ask your blessings on them. We thank you for answering our prayers in so many ways, not just in regard to our people that uh, have been sick or, or, or bereaved, but for uh, people who have seen improvements in, in their lives, their jobs, and other things. We're, we, we recognize that your hand is not only uh, with us in regard to our people that are sick, but uh, in everything uh, that, uh, that uh, we might be concerned about. And we're thankful uh, that you have assured us that we can cast our cares on you because you care for us. We love you and we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. It's a pretty uh, popular question that I've received from time to time. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7.39 what does the phrase only in the Lord mean in 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 39? And I've always been, I've always been of the mind that it, it probably means exactly what it says and what any, what any reasonable uh, conclusion would be drawn just if you, were, if you were reading the text, what does it mean? Uh, and just to read the text, uh, uh, first of all, all of 1 Corinthians chapter 7 deals with relationships between husbands and wives or with marriage, okay? And there are a, there are a number there are a number of uh, uh, there are a number of different aspects to that. Uh, and so and this is the concluding verse of this chapter and then Paul addresses a completely different subject in chapter 8 verse 1. All right, and so this is the final statement in a, a, a fairly lengthy discourse with regard to matters pertaining uh, to marriage, and it says, uh, speaking about in verse thirty-nine, it says, "A wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives, but if her husband dies, she is at liberty to be married to whom she wishes." Only in the Lord. And in verse 40, But she is happier if she remains as she is, according to my judgment. And I think I also have the Spirit of God. So she may be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. What does that phrase mean? I don't, look, I don't see any other conclusion that it means to marry a Christian. 
That's what, I've, that's what I've always believed that it meant. And I believe that if, if one is just simply reading this text, that's the conclusion that one, that one would draw. Uh, I, I, I don't know another conclusion that might be drawn. A number of years ago, and I, I, uh, we were studying when we were still had, uh, when we first had a young adult class uh, over there across from my old office, uh, I, we were studying the book of 1 Corinthians out of one of the particular uh, lesson book series. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, book, the, uh, the book said uh, um, that it probably, it probably means only a Christian, but it might mean a person who is uh, scripturally eligible to marry. And I thought, there's no way. Nobody, nobody would draw that conclusion from reading the text. I mean, it would never, it would never occur to anybody, among, to me, among the Corinthians, uh, to uh, to uh, draw that conclusion. It means only, only in the Lord refers to to marry a Christian. Now, right? Yeah. If yeah, if her husband was, if her husband, <laughs> right? Yeah. If her husband is dead, then then, but but then some might say, well. It's talking about the next husband, not you know, not her. Obviously, she's eligible to marry, but the you know the next uh, the next husband, and so um, but and so then the question is: Is it would would it then be a sin for a widow to not marry a Christian? Would it be a sin for a widow to not marry a Christian? By the way, I think even though it's talking about widows, I think it probably works both ways: widows and widowers. That's what that's what I've always. Uh, understood, but I want you to go back in the text to verses twenty-five and twenty-six. Twenty-five and twenty-six, because there is a there is a preface to this entire section, and that preface is verse twenty-six, the present distress. Because of the present distress. Paul begins by saying, Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment from the Lord, yet I give judgment as one whom the Lord in His mercy has made trustworthy. He says, I suppose therefore that this is good because of the present distress that it is good for a man to remain as he is. And it's my understanding and belief that the, the preface, the present distress... Is the overriding is the overriding uh, consideration to the rest of the chapter? For this reason, you look at you look at what is written by Paul in verses twenty seven through forty. Um, uh, these things are are to me obviously peculiar to or particular to the church at Corinth. Uh, you find in um, you find in verses twenty seven and twenty eight. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be loosed. Are you loosed from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But even if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she's not sinned. Nevertheless, such will have trouble in the flesh, but I would spare you. Now look, that's not, that's not, a, that's not a truism for everybody everywhere. You know what I mean by that? In other words, the phrase, you will have trouble in the flesh if you do these things, and I'm trying to spare you this trouble. Well, that's, that's not true of marriage at, at all times and in every place. But it was true of the Corinthian church at that time in that particular situation. Uh, note in verse 29, but this I say, brethren, the time is short. In other words, the time of the present distress uh, is, is short. It's, 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 uh, it's nearby. Okay, uh, but the I think the end of it is also soon to come. He says it's a present distress, which means it's ongoing, and then the time is short. I think modifies the length of time of the distress. Does that make sense? That the, that the time of this uh, uh, distress uh, is going to be brief, but uh, but there are, there are things all through this text that uh, that are obviously modified. Uh, by the con, uh, by the uh, the concept or the construct of the present, the present distress. Note verse twenty eight. He's like he says, "I want to, you know, I want to spare you." And then uh, verse thirty two again deals expressly with the present distress. It says, uh, "I want you to be without care." 
that is unnecessarily uh, with unnecessary uh, distractions or concerns. He who is unmarried cares about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. Now, again, that's not true in, in, across the board with regard to that the man who is unmarried only cares about the things of the Lord. What Paul says is he's able to focus on things that pertain to the Lord, but the man who is married has other considerations, right? You know, those of us that are husbands understand that. That, that whatever goes on in this world doesn't just concern me, it concerns me and Rhonda. And I have to, you know, and I have to make plans and preparations or, or, or act in such a way as to make sure that, that, that I protect Rhonda from whatever might be going on. All right, and that, and that will be true for any, uh, for any husband. And so again, Paul is, is talking about a, a specific action taking place in a specific uh, in a specific time. And then he goes on in verses uh, uh, 34 through um, through verse 38, talking about. It seems to me that he's talking about perhaps people who either are about to be married or about fathers who are about to give their daughters in marriage. And there's this long, I say long, well, it's five or six verse discussion about the matter of virgins marrying and you know what you know what should you know what should you know you do and, you know he says there's a difference between a wife and a virgin the unmarried woman cares about the things of the lord that she may be both a holy in body and spirit but she who is married cares about the things of the world how she may please her husband and this i say for your profit not that i may put a leash on you but for what is proper that you might serve the lord without distraction and then again verse 36 if any man thinks he is behaving improperly toward uh, 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 toward his virgin says uh, if she be past the flower of youth and thus it must be let him do what he wishes he does not sin let them marry now I think that's talking about a, a man dealing with his daughter I, I think that's the implication of the text but the point is this the present distress is the overriding context of this entire of this entire section of scripture. And so with that in mind, I think the text says what it says. I think and I think it means exactly what it says. But I also think it's prefaced by the present distress. So therefore I don't think I don't think that it is uh, that it is a prohibition against marrying uh, uh, marrying outside the faith uh, in every case. Now Having said that, I'm pretty sure that I can make the case that it's always been God's will for, for it's always been God's will for His people to marry people of like precious faith. All the way back, all the way back to Genesis chapter six, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful, and they chose of them all uh, wives of whom they uh, wanted. Sons of God, daughters of men. First thing, the sons of God are not angels. Angels don't marry. God didn't send angels to the earth. They didn't marry women. Jesus said, angels do not marry, neither are they given in marriage. Matthew 22. All right? uh, angels are, as generally speaking, angels are uh, referred to in the male, uh, in the male sense with regard to uh, pronouns, etc., but the sons of God are not angels. The sons of God are men who were followers of God. The daughters of men were women who were not followers of God. By the way, when you go, if you were to go through, if you were to go through your Bible and you see the phrase of God and of men in the same verse or the same context, what you're seeing is a dichotomy between faithful people, people that are faithful to God, and people who are not faithful to God. Uh, you can see it in 1 Peter chapter 4. You know, he's talking about that we must do the will of God and not follow after the lusts of men. And so when you see the sons of God and daughters of men, what you're finding is a contrast in the attitudes of those two people. Sons of God are men that are following God. The daughters of men are, are ungodly. And, then, and, and I can show you that to be true because what was the result of that? You know, what happened when the sons of God 
married the daughters of men. What was the result of that? Led them astray. You know, the thought and intent of every man's heart was to only do evil continually. You know, this was the very thing that led to the corruption of the entire world. You know, they selected their wives based on the beauty uh, of, the, uh, of, their, uh, of, their, of their outside without any regard to the, the character that was on the inside. And that these women led these men astray. And the, again, the end result was the flood. And so, and so Genesis 6 shows us what happens when, when, godly, when, godly, uh, uh, when the godly marry the ungodly. Deuteronomy 7 when God prohibited the Israelites from marrying among the seven Canaanite nations. By the way, I think we've missed it a little bit in this respect. Uh, God did not forbid the Jews from intermarrying anyone outside the Jewish faith. The prohibition was against the seven Canaanite nations because Moses married an Ethiopian. Ethiopians were not among the seven Canaanite nations, all right? Moses was not rebuked by God or condemned for marrying an Ethiopian woman. All right, so it was the seven Canaanite nations that, that uh, they were forbidden to marry or, or, or intermarry. You know, taking their daughters for your sons, giving your daughters to their sons. And then God gives the reason for it. He says, for they will turn your heart away from following me. And then I'll have to punish you. And I don't want to have to, God says, I don't want to, have to punish you. And, 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 and what do we find from the time the children of Israel entered into Canaan? They intermarried with the Canaanite people, and what happened? They, led, they were led away. They were led away. And then what happened? They got punished. Over and over again, we see this, we see this cycle. And so the, the prohibition of intermarriage in Deuteronomy 7 as I oftentimes like to point out, doesn't have anything to do with the race of the people and it has everything to do with the religion of the people. And so there's again a, a, there again is a, a, an admonition to marry those of like precious faith. Uh, and in the New Testament, uh, the Bible says that, uh, um, for example, that, uh, that uh, we're not to have fellowship or be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Now that context is not speaking specifically to marriage, but I think it would apply in some ways. The principle is still there. The principle is still there. Yeah. And, and by the way, uh, you can, uh, and it's been years, it's been 40 years since these studies were done, and, um, and yet I still cite them because they were accurate then. But a number of lengthy... To maintain the purity of the faith. Yeah. I mean, you want to marry somebody that's going to help you. You want to marry somebody that's going to help you go to heaven. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there were three different studies done in the 70s and 80s or the, the, that were concluded in the 70s and 80s of members of the church who married outside the faith. And four out of five left the faith in all three studies. Four out of five. Christians who married outside the faith left the faith. That's a that's a bad bet. Yeah. You know, that's the opposite of Russian roulette. Yeah. Russian roulette is you've got a you've got a cylinder in a pistol and you only put one bullet in it and you spin the cylinder and you pull the trigger. And nobody nobody in their right mind is gonna play Russian roulette with one. Alright? But four out of five is you put four bullets in the cylinders and there's only one empty cylinder. And then you spin it and pull the, you know, who, you know, who's going to play that game? I mean, it, and yet we're talking about something far more important than just simply losing your life. We're talking about losing your soul. And so, you know, the, the Bible is, is clear and, and the testimony of history is clear uh, that God desires His people, God desires His people to marry those of like precious faith. But again, I'm not saying it's a sin not to do so. But I would like for somebody to show me how you can prove all things and hold fast that which is good and, and, and promote it. And so the Bible, the Bible teaches uh, these things. That God has always desired His people to marry those of like precious faith. Now let me give one more, one more statement to this effect from 1 Corinthians 7, 12 and 1 Peter 3, 1 to 6. Uh, you have in 1 Peter... Me, in 1 Corinthians 7, beginning in verse 12, Paul giving instructions 
to uh, Christian women who are married to non-Christian husbands. And you have a similar statement in 1 Peter 3, 1 of Christian women who are married to non-Christian husbands. It's my belief that Paul is talking to people who were already married before they became Christians. When you read 1 Corinthians 7, Paul says, uh, 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 to the rest I say, not I, uh, I, not the Lord, if a brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who does not believe and he's willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. And so it appears to me, contextually speaking, that you have the, you have, a, 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 we'll just use me, me and Rhonda, use that as an example. That Rhonda and I are married, Rhonda becomes a Christian, I, I do not become a Christian. Now, Rhonda knows how important it is to be a Christian, and how important it is to do what Jesus wants. And the question is then, do I need to leave, do I need to leave my non-Christian husband in order to be a faithful Christian? That's the question that's being asked. And Paul says, no. <laughs> no, you don't. If they're content to live with you, do not divorce them. He says, first of all, the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. And what he's talking about is this. In a general way, the, you know, let marriage be held in honor among all and the bed undefiled, Hebrews 13 and verse 4. So what is he saying? He's saying that, 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 the, uh, that, the, um, that the sexual union is, is made holy by marriage. And to separate would make such a thing unholy. And also he says, your children are holy. But what he doesn't mean your children are... When he says your children are holy, what he's saying is your children are being brought into the world the way that God wants them to be brought into the world with a mama and daddy. And so that's, that's the statement uh, in the context of 1 Corinthians 7. And then again, 1 Peter 3, 1 to 6, you have a, a woman who has a husband who does not believe and I think, again, the context is they were married before she became a Christian. I can't prove that, but it just seems to me that's the way everything lays out because it says that he is going to be won by the conversation of the wife. Or the, con the conversation means the conduct. And that he can even be won without a word. You know, I think about, uh, I think about Rhonda's grandparents, uh, her, her, mom's, her mom's parents, that... Uh, that uh, her grand, grandpa was not a Christian. And in fact, he was adamantly against the church. And yet, without, I say, without the word, he was converted by the actions of Rhonda's grandma. That, that she was, you know, was going to put the Lord first, no matter what. And, and he didn't understand that. He couldn't understand how somebody would be willing to, you know, to, to do what she was going to do you know, even if he expressly forbid it, like going to church, and she what she didn't give in. You know, she didn't. Uh, you know, she didn't waver in her faith. And then, and I think it's a perfect example that you know it wasn't that she sat down and studied the Bible with him, but he was won over primarily through her conduct. And that's probably somebody at the church there. Was she at Southside then? No. I don't remember where they lived at that time, but in any event, you know, somebody taught him the gospel, but but the, the conversion process started by her actions, the way that she lived uh, before him. And so I wanted to make mention of, of those uh, things uh, specifically. All right, any questions about that? <laughs>